Hello, I'm Apostle Johnny McKim. You've already got me. God bless you. This is Apostle Johnny Lee Kim. I'm coming to you from MEC Ministries. And I would just like to say it's my pleasure to be with you today to share the good news of the gospel. Today we have a very interesting subject that we want to deal with. And we're dealing with knowing God, or you can say the nature of God. I'm going to read from the 16th chapter here of Matthew's Gospel starting at the 13th verse when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples saying whom do men say that I the son of man am and they said some say thou art John the Baptist some Elijah others Jeremiah or one of the prophets in the 15th verse he made it very personal he saith unto them but whom say ye that I am and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I want to take this here, and I want to expound on this just a little bit. First of all, when we hear other Christians talk, you will usually hear people, if you get into a conversation about knowing God, they will say, well, I know the Lord, I'm saved, and if they're uh, spirit feel they'll say I'm saved and I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit but does that mean that you know God because you're saved and you're baptized in the Holy Spirit first and foremost I'm a believer in the fact that you cannot know a person very well that you don't have communication with now for me communication is not just me talking but communication is a dialogue where you speak I listen I speak you listen often when we pray we pray and we do all the talking often we don't stop long enough to hear or to listen for what God wants to say and often God is trying to get a word through to us and the only true way you can communicate with him is when you pray after you pray just take a while and sit and listen and wait and see if God is putting anything in your spirit sometimes he may speak in a still small voice that sounds audible but you need to take time just to be quiet focus on him and listen another way to know him is through scripture jesus said this he said when you have seen me you have seen the father what jesus did to humanity was he revealed his true nature to them now if you look in the old testament and you try to say who god is based on his Old Testament actions, then you really don't know God. Because what he did in the Old Testament, there was a reason for what he done. Number one, if you study from Moses, I should say from Adam to Moses, you will notice something. From Adam to Moses, according to Romans, the book of Romans, I believe it's 5 and 13, we're told that from Adam all the way up to Moses, the same God that people know as a judging God, a God of wrath, a God that takes out the enemies of Israel, the same God was a God of love, patience, mercy, and forgiveness. All of that he was in the Old Testament from Adam all the way down to Moses whom the Bible calls the lawgiver. We have seen in religion where God has been introduced 
as this powerful, no nonsense, won't accept no foolishness from anybody kind of God. But Jesus came on the scene later and showed us another God, same God, but a different picture of him. He himself came to reveal the Father to us through him. When he said these words, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What that means is the way he operated, his love, his patience, his forgiveness, his kindness, the way he dealt with his enemies, the way he dealt with his disciples, the way he dealt with sickness, disease, the way he dealt with needs. He was simply saying, I'm revealing my nature to you, humanity. And if you look at me, if you look at the picture of me that I have revealed to you, then you're looking at the Father because this is the true nature of the Father that you see in me. I am my Father, he said, we're one. The reason that a lot of people can't receive things from God that are Christian, we're speaking completely and strictly about Christians because we're in a blood covenant with God right now. The world, sinners who have chosen not to serve him, they don't have the same privileges. They don't have the same rights that God has given us, his children. We are children of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. He is our elder brother, captain of our salvation, way maker, and so many other great titles. But the thing of it is, God is our Heavenly Father, and think about this. If our earthly fathers know how to do good things to us and for us, and know how to forgive us when we were being bad kids, if they know how to be patient and long-suffering with us, then what about God? If you see God and His love is less than the love that your parents showed you, then you don't know the true nature of God. The thing I want you to focus on today is when you pray, how do you see God? When you ask him for something, how do you see him? When you're standing and trying to be in faith to believe him for what your needs are, how do you see him? The way you see any individual, including God, will determine what you believe you can get from them. If you see him as a judge only, a God of wrath, as the Old Testament seems to show us, notice, I'm not saying it showed it, it seems to show us that. If you focus on his judgment of nations and people at times and don't really understand why he did it, then, my brothers and sisters, you won't know the true nature of God. I want to share a few things with you about this subject that you may or may not know. Number one, God is looking for his people to be in his presence. His love is so powerful that he wants us to be there in a relationship with him where we trust his love so much that when we ask for anything, our faith will receive what we've asked for all because we know his true nature and we know how much he truly loves us. Too often people are being preached to about the power of God, but not enough about the love of God. Where I come from, people preach a lot about sin, a lot about God judging, uh, a lot about him being angry and they go back and they pick up Old Testament doctrines, Old Testament incidences and they try to make God operate under the New Testament the same way he did under the Old, but that's not true. God is operating today, I want to say this to you, completely different from how he operated under the Old Covenant. And there are reasons for that. First of all, man was a dead spirit. He couldn't receive the spirit of God because he was a dead spirit. 
and because of Adam's sin, there was no true payment for sin. There was only a covering, which was the shedding of the blood of sheep and goats once a year. And it never got rid of the problem of corruption and sin in the life of man. It only gave them a temporary fix once every year. But when Jesus came, he was the true Lamb of God, and he shed his blood, the Apostle Paul said, and he did it once and for all, meaning he doesn't come and shed his blood every year as they did in the Old Covenant, but he came and he not only eradicated sin, atoned for sin, but he fixed it where sin would never separate us from God again. Meaning, once you're born again, and let's say you fall into sin, I know this is gonna, gonna rattle and shake some churches, some preachers and some religions, what I'm about to say, but it's okay, you can write me a letter, it's okay. But as long as it's right here in the word of God, it's, it's cool, it's fine. Sin will not separate you from God because if you read the scriptures, the scriptures is clear. And I want to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you. I want you to see it for yourself. If you don't have out your Bible, take it out so you can follow me. And I'm going to show you this truth here. And Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will make you free or set you free. And if you look at Romans 5 and 13, it says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. We no longer live by the law. And God is no longer imputing sin the way he did under the law. What that means is I'm not telling you I agree with sin, no. I'm not telling you God agrees with sin, no. I'm telling you if a child of God fail, if a child of God, because of their flesh or because of Satan, people are saying God is so holy, he cannot stand sinful, corrupt flesh. So if you sin, the Holy Ghost immediately backs off or leaves you. That's unscriptural. That's unscriptural. The Bible said we have been sealed by the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. What that is, is like paraffin that you use to, to seal jars that, that you're putting preserves in. And it keeps all the impurities out. And that jar could last for hundreds of years because of the paraffin that's been placed over the contents of that jar. The Holy Ghost sealed us. He's our down payment, according to the scriptures. And what he did was he sealed our human spirit where he presides at, where sin cannot get in your spirit. Or oh, you could sin with your body. You could get sin in your soul, but not in your spirit. Because it's been sealed. And the thing you have to understand is God did that for protection. So sin doesn't get in your spirit. And if you fall because Satan gets involved or the lust of the flesh gets involved, the thing God wants you to do is just to get that thing cleaned up and get away from it and go on with your life because he's not here to put his foot on you. The true nature of God is here to rescue you, to protect you. Let, let me give you a good example of protection that uh, a lot of us have overlooked down through the years. Open your Bible and go to Genesis chapter 4, and I'm going to show you a divine truth down here. And I believe it's around verse 15. Genesis 4 and verse 15. It is. And this is after the first family of the human race had already come into existence, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. And Cain was jealous of his brother and angry with God because God didn't accept his sacrifice of vegetables rather than a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice of a goat or a sheep. And he became violently angry. And because God accepted his brother Abel's blood sacrifice, Cain got jealous of him and that anger he had towards God. He turned it on his brother and he slew him and the brother's blood fell into the sand 
And God confronted him and asked him about his brother. Where's your brother? And he turns to God and says, am I my brother's keeper? Now, that, that's a pretty stupid thing to say to God when he knows all and he sees all. And Cain knew that. But because he was upset, he spoke like that. But if you listen to what God said to him, you'll see love come out of this here. Where, where God, instead of like some people think, judging him, jumping all over him, the first thing, God didn't do that. That was not the first thing he did. But he simply said to Cain that the blood of his brother was speaking, crying out to him from the sand where he spilled it. Now, God dealt with him like a loving father. And I'm going to show you that in this 15th verse. After he had pronounced to Cain what the consequences of his sin would be, Cain tells God, that's hard. You've driven me out. And if you look at it in the 14th verse, you've driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from the face and from thy face. Now notice what he said. God, you've driven me from your face. He said, your face will be hid from me because of my sin. And he was literally saying to God, that, that, that's too hard. The consequences of my sin, my iniquity, is too hard for me. And he said, and everyone who sees me, God, they're going to slay me. They're going to kill me. But look at what God said in the 15th verse. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark, here it is, a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. What that tells you is that God, after this man, had become the first murderer in the human race. God's love was so powerful that instead of God judging him with the death penalty, God turns around and puts a mark on him that nobody else would kill him either. That's called protection, people. Protection. What is it that made God protect him instead of judging him unto death? A powerful love that our natural minds cannot begin to fathom or comprehend. I want you to see God the way the Bible tells us he truly is. He's not this, this God that's schizophrenic. That he's loving one moment and killing in the next moment. He's not so schizophrenic that he blesses you over here and then he kills you over here. The reason some things were done, I'll explain that in a later lesson. But today, I want you to know God wants you to come close to him. And, and he wants you to be in a relationship with him where you stay in his presence from day to day. And I'm speaking to you, child of God. I'm not speaking to the world. I'm speaking to the church. Because many of you know God as far as the Bible talks about him in some ways. But to truly know him, to know him, know him, you have to study him in the New Testament under grace. And then you could know him, know him. But also, you need to cultivate a personal relationship with him. I find that when you trust an individual, you can go to that same individual and if there are needs that you have and they are capable of supplying it, you will go to them believing that your needs are going to be met through them. Why? Because you trust them. And why do you trust them? Because you've gone or grown to know them. If you don't know a person, their true nature, their true character. You could go to them and ask for help and you could go to them with an uncertainty and a doubt as to whether they will help you or not. But when you know a person and you know them, know them, their nature, and you know they're a giving, loving individual and that they will be there for you, you will go to them with confidence and ask for what you need. You, you've proven that I'm sure many times in your own life. And this is why the devil will try to paint an evil picture of God because he himself knows 
who he really is. And he also knows that if God's children come to him in faith and confidence, all of their needs are met. He knows that. So what he does is he takes people who, who has mixed up theology, wrong theology, and he puts them in the forefront in ministries. And sometimes he causes them, whether, whether some of you believe this or not, he causes some of these churches to be full of people so that you will think that the preacher that gets up because he's got a thousand members really knows God in a special way. And that's not necessarily true. I have sat and listened at my colleagues teach or preach. I've heard some of the things that they stand for. And I can be honest with you, a lot of that stuff is totally unscriptural. It is their opinion. It is their belief. It is the way they've interpreted the Bible. And it's wrong. Because you can take other verses in the Bible and disprove what they're saying. And what the devil does is he takes these types of preachers, teachers, and I don't take it wrong. I'm not trying to put them down. I'm just showing you that you can't believe everything that comes across the pulpit unless you can verify it in the word of God. And what they do is they paint a picture of God. I've heard preachers say with my own two ears, God will kill you. And what they do is they make it like if you sin so badly, so much, you could go so far and sin that God will kill you. People, people, you cannot find that in the New Testament anywhere. That's the covenant we live under, New Testament covenant. God doesn't kill you because you sin. If that's the case, he better just wipe out San Francisco, and get rid of it, or some of these other places where Satan is in control. God is not like that. That is, that is trying to make him operate or do things the way he did in the old covenant. And he doesn't do things like that. He said, well, why did he do it then? That's another teaching. I'll explain. But he didn't destroy city after city because of sin, even in the old covenant days. He did not. There were just certain places where he had to do those things for specific reasons. And I want you to get that. Those of you that think you got to beg him, twist his arm to get him to heal you, to get him to give you a job, that's not the way it is. I used to believe that you had to fast so many days and pray so many days before God could use you even to walk in supernatural power. That's not even true. There are times when, when I prayed for people and I haven't fasted in a month, and yet the power of God flow, and they're healed, they're delivered of devils. Was it the fast? No, it was the love of God for me, for them, and my faith in what his word said. That's what brought the deliverance. That's what brought the healing power. I've been teaching before today on Ephesians 1 and 3 and 2 Peter 1 and 3. According to Ephesians 1 and 3, blessed be God our Heavenly Father, who hath given unto us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice he hath, 2 Peter 1, 3 also tells us that God hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Notice he said half in both cases, meaning everything we will ever need as believers, as Christians, healing, deliverance, prosperity, or anything that applies to our daily lives. God has already supplied it. This You will learn that God is not this big schizophrenic, powerful want to take you out kind of God if you sin all he wants you to do is live right live holy and if you stay in his presence holiness will just ooze out of you because you can't be in the presence of God daily and walk out of his presence and be the same it is impossible because the more we are in his presence the more we become like him in our daily walk with him you could i want to i want to show you something in the natural realm you could get around certain people and if they speak a certain way it is their natural way of speaking 
if they form their sentences a certain way, within two weeks, you will start to say things the same way they said them. If you get around people, for months at a time especially, there are ways that they have, actions that they have, you will begin to slowly pick up those. That's called the law of association. If you hang out with God daily, in prayer, in the word, in worship, a few hours a day, I tell you what, you start to be more like God than you ever thought you could be. All of those idiosyncrasies you got, God will begin to take them out of you one by one. The reason many Christians get saved, even spirit-filled, and still act the same way is because they don't have a relationship with God. They don't spend any real time with God. But they say, I love the Lord. Anything you love, beloved, you want to be with it as much as possible. I challenge you to think of when you was in love with some girl or some girl, you was in love with some guy. I challenge you to think about this. Didn't you want to talk to them every day? Five or six times a day? You wanted to be with them all the time. Am I not right? Well, God is calling for us to come into his presence and never leave his presence day by day. I don't mean stay there all day. I mean just give him some quality time each day. We, we have gotten to a place in the body of Christ, especially us Bible teachers teaching the people where we get caught up in the mechanics of Christianity too much, the theories too much, the principles too much of how things work. And we find out what moves God and what causes things to happen for us by knowing how to walk according to the kingdom of God's principles. And then we began to sacrifice our relationship for the principles and the mechanics. In other words, we depend too much on the mechanics of how to apply faith, the mechanics of how to apply the laws of prosperity. And when things began to happen, we began to lean more on those than our relationship with God, and we must be careful with that because that's called losing your focus. Again, we're talking about knowing God, His nature, but you've got to get a relationship and you've got to stay in His presence. Amen? Now I want to just stop right here and pause for a moment. I want to say if this program is a blessing to you, then don't think it robbery to send us a donation just to help us with expenses. If God leads you to do it, fine. If not, don't you worry about it because God always supplies our needs. I want you to know that I love you and I'm just trying to give you something that I know works for me and others. You go with God and God will go with you. God bless you now. Here at Reggae Land Music, we carry the latest releases from indie artists such as Daniel Musgrove. The greatest story that was ever told over 2,000 years ago. We stock the latest reggae, gospel reggae, and more. Hard to find vinyl, Studio One, Treasure Isle, etc. You can find us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and you can make your purchases at reggaelandmusic.com. You can also call us at 954-987-7779. Reggae Land Music. The place you want to be, baby. Here at Musgrove Music, where we bring your hidden talent to the surface, we provide you with music lessons such as the guitar, the keyboard, the drums, and also music production, video production, and vocal lessons. Whatever your hidden talents are, come on in to Musgrove Music and we'll bring it to the surface. You can reach Musgrove Music at www. Musgrove Music.